What you're about to watch is a real stroke analysis I made for one of my recent online students, TJ. He's a high-level player who was looking to improve his two-handed backhand. So he went onto my website, twominutetennis.net, and he signed up for a video stroke analysis lesson. In fact, just today I reached out to him and I said, TJ, do you mind if I upload your video to YouTube so others can learn from your analysis? And he said, no problem. So thank you, TJ, for your permission. And while you're watching this lesson, if you're thinking to yourself, wait, I want Ryan to analyze my technique, simply go to twominutetennis.net to sign up, or you can just click the link that's in the description and also pinned in the first comment. So enjoy the video, and I hope this really helps you improve your two-hander. Hey TJ, it's Ryan over at Two Minute Tennis. So glad you gave me this opportunity to help you with your backhand. It's obvious that you are a very good player. So I wanna give you some really simple things because at your level, uh, it, it's not super complicated, you know, earth shattering things. We're gonna be just making some simple tweaks in order to make your backhand better. I have no doubt that you'll be able to learn these things super quickly. Uh, we're gonna talk about the way you take your racket back. We're gonna talk about the position of your racket once it's in the back. We're going to talk about your, the use of your legs, uh, you know, what your legs should be doing. We're going to talk about the racket at the bottom of the swing. Uh, and I actually want to talk to you about your finish because uh, really everything then culminates that you do prior to contact and during contact. It's going to culminate into the, the finish that you have. Um, so the first thing, let's get right to it. When you take your racket back, you have a reset of the racket. Let me actually go to this first one here. It's a perfect example of it. So I'm going to draw a circle where your racket is. And I want you to notice how you take your racket back. So right there is the height of your backswing. So you're taking your racket back like, uh, give me a second here. Let me get the right tool. Here we go. You're taking your racket back like this. Watch your racket follow that red arrow. Now, obviously, if you want to go from point A to point B, it is going to be a straight line that is going to be in your best interest, especially at your level with the speed the ball can come in. Whenever someone is going down and then back up again, there's a clear opportunity to make their backswing more efficient so it takes less time. Plus, when you take your racket back by going up, it has to stop to change direction. So not only does going down and then up take longer than going straight back, but when your racket is going up, it must come to a complete stop. The racket has to stop in order for it to go back down to then hit the ball. If you keep your racket up, then it just turns the corner. And so you can actually handle fast shots more easily for those two reasons. The, it takes less time to take the racket back if you just keep the tip of the racket pointing up the whole time. And then you can just turn the corner and go. You'll see that when you take it back, like right here, the tip of the racket is basically pointing at the camera. Here, the tip of the racket is pointing up. Tip of the racket's facing the camera. And then the tip of your racket is pointing up again. So it should be pointing up the whole time you take the racket back. So a simple way of thinking of this is place a coin on the edge of the racket. And when you take the racket back, you just keep the coin on the racket. Here I am in my driveway um, demonstrating this exact idea. So you can see where the tip of my racket is pointing. And watch how I take the racket back. And the tip of the racket stays up the whole time. If I put a yellow line, I'll make it a straight line. Watch my racket go along that yellow line. So this is going from point A to point B. You're going like this. So if I see someone making this move and I see someone making this move, I know the person going along the green will be able to get their racket back sooner. It will take less time for them to take the racket back. So that's the first thing that you want to do. You want to keep the tip of the racket up the whole time and you're just going to film yourself and you're just going to compare it to your old swing. You're going to see which one, you know, looks different. <laughs> and the tip of the racket staying up the whole time is going to make it more efficient in the way you take the racket back. Then when you take your racket back, you can just drop that, that way and you can just turn and go 
And so that way you can handle faster shots even more easily. Now, if you're looking for people in your local area to play against, practice with, or if you want to find a coach who's close to you who's going to be able to help you with your game, then use my link in the description, playyourcourt.com slash two-minute tennis. And when you use my link to sign up, you get 50% off. Now, TJ, the second thing I want to show you is the position of your racket once you take it back. And the racket should be going back 180 degrees behind you. And so, like, opposite your ready position, right? So when you take your racket back, you really have two backswings when it comes to the position of your racket, and it has to do with the height of contact. Here on the left, you're hitting a low ball. Here on the right, you're hitting a higher ball. You can see the difference. On the left, you're hitting the ball just above knee height with your right knee. And obviously on the left here, we're contacting the ball kind of chest height. So the take back and the racket position is different on both. If we look at the racket on the right here, this is the perfect view of it. If we look at the racket on the left, your racket is ever so slightly closed, which is fine. I would actually recommend straight up and down, which I'm, I am going to recommend that you do, but the racket face a few degrees closed is not a problem at all. You'll see on the right though, your racket face is wide open. So the racket you want to be straight up and down, whether it's a high ball or a low ball. You want to be able to basically balance a coin on the edge of your racket. And the reason is because it's going to help you to close the racket face. When you drop your racket, I'm sorry, let me say it this way. When you have a low ball and you drop your racket, your racket face closes. Now, you can't really see it, but like right here, we can see it sort of. But your racket face is like this, and that means your racket face is closed. When you have a higher ball, your racket face is open, and that means you have to roll over the ball, and you can see that. Well, it feels like you're rolling over the ball, but you're having to turn the racket. And after you contact the ball, your strings are pointing down. You'll see when you have a low ball, your racket after you hit the ball is facing up. The racket will always be opposite itself prior to contact versus after contact. So here the strings are slightly closed. After contact, the racket is open. Here your racket face is open and then you have to turn it to have it be closed. This is what we want. We want the racket to be closed prior to hitting the ball. Remember closed means tilted slightly toward the ground. And then you can just swing up for spin, and that's a beautiful backhand. And then the racket after contact is actually facing slightly up after contact. We're going to talk about this. On the right here, because your racket face, when it's a high ball, is laid open. Let me get to it. There you go. Because on a high ball, your racket face is laid open, when your racket drops, it tends to stay open. Then you have to roll the racket over and then your strings point down. So the fix for this is actually just to make sure that you really work on whether it's a lower contact or it's a higher contact that your racket is straight up and down. One of the things you do very nicely is the turn of your, the, the height of your turn is relative to the contact. So if we look here, uh, basically your head and the racket are the same height. Where on this one, we can see, you know, your head, is, you know, the tip of the racket is higher than head level. Where here, the tip of the racket is basically the same height as your head. And that's due to the contact height, which is correct. On the higher contact, you're going to typically turn higher. On lower contacts, you're going to turn lower. What you want to do is have this position where the racket's either two degrees closed or it can be straight, oops, or it can be straight up and down. That, that, like this is the range of acceptability right here. But you got to be able to do it when the ball is higher. But because your racket face is open, now it lay, when the racket drops, it lays open, and then you've got to roll over the back of the ball, which just causes immense amounts of inconsistency. If I were to teach someone to play you, I would say, hey, just loop the ball high with topspin up on TJ's backhand and watch him struggle. And it's all because your racket face lays open. So instead of this, you're going to have to have this. You're going to have to have the racket straight up and down when you take the racket back, whether it's a high ball or a low ball. 
Here's a look at that. You can see the tip of the racket, by the way, is staying up as we talked about. And then look at my racket. You could absolutely take a coin and place it uh, on the edge of my racket and the coin would stay on. You're doing this and you can see my racket is probably one degree or two degrees slightly closed. So ever so slightly closed. You're doing this when it's a lower ball. When the ball's coming low to you, you're good. Like I, I wouldn't want to hit fast, low balls to your backhand. You'll smoke those. In my opinion, I've never played you. I've never watched you play a whole match. But just based on your technique, if the ball comes low to you, man, like you, because you have the technique to handle it. It's when the ball comes high to you, the ball bounces and comes high to you. That's when you correctly raise the turn, like you take the racket higher on the way back, but it's open. And because it's open, then when it drops down, it opens. You can see when I drop my racket down, watch my racket. See how the racket's closed? And that's what you do correctly when you are dealing with a low ball. You've got to be able to close your racket face slightly even on a high ball. And it's going to be much easier to do that if your racket is straight up and down. Now, the best way to practice these techniques is at home with a Topspin Pro. You can get a Topspin Pro using my link in the description. I'm also going to pin it in the first comment. I absolutely love the Topspin Pro, and I know you will too. Now, TJ, the next idea is when you drop your racket, we want to also drop the body. So you're tall, right? I'm 5'8". <laughs> you're 6'5". You were probably 6'5". When, or you were probably 5'8". Uh, in like 6th grade. <laughs> um, so, so even more so, you have to get used to bending your knees. And I, it's something called sit and lift. When the racket goes down, you want to feel like your body is going down too. Now, in what I'm doing here is a bit of an exaggeration, but the reason I like to show exaggerations is people typically fall short of what you teach them. So if you teach them an exaggeration, they fall short of an exaggeration, they end up doing the right thing. So exaggerations are very uh, beneficial or teaching an exaggeration is very beneficial uh, in learning a sport or dancing or whatever, right? So watch how my racket and my body go down. So if I draw a line at the top of my head, as my racket goes down, you can see yellow to yellow, watch this, yellow to yellow. And then as my body goes down, we'll make this green, so does my racket. So my body is going down, obviously not as much as my racket, but my body is going down. And then my body comes down and then watch, it comes back up again. So it's down and then up. And so when I'm contacting the ball right there, I'm back up to the height I had for the take back. So my head is going like this. Watch my head go down and then back up again. You'll watch your drop and we do the same thing, yellow line and there's the top of your racket. Watch your racket go down. Your racket goes down with no legs. So one of the thing that's gonna, one thing that's gonna help you to get lower below the ball for better topspin so you can swing up a um, little more steeply is to sit. Now you don't wanna sit down as you're taking the racket back. You'll notice when I'm taking the racket back, I'm not getting shorter as I take my racket back. I'm still at the same height. I'm still at this height as I take my racket back. Then as the racket goes down, that's when I sink down and then come back up again. So as you're taking the racket back, stay 6'5 as you take it back. But as the racket goes down, you should get to six feet tall. You should, you should lose five inches as your body is dropping. And you can see I'm doing that too. I'm going down. I'm probably getting down to shorter than five feet actually. You might be, you know, think of it even more. But you've got to drop your body down to help you get lower below the ball. Then be able to turn and kind of corkscrew up. You can see my body rotating and I'm coming up as I'm rotating. So it's like a corkscrew like that. So you're rotating correctly. You can see your back foot turns up on the toe, but you're not using your legs. So you're losing the ability to get lower below the ball and to use the legs as a power source and to be able to use the energy from your legs through a kinetic chain all the way through the ball. 
So as your racket is going down, your body should be going down. And you can see I'm lifting back up again. As my racket goes up, so does my body. So my body and racket go down, and then they come up. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about, TJ, and then I'm going to show you some pros doing these things, is the extension and the finish. So you are very kind of pretzeled up and, and kind of all shriveled up on your follow through. And you can see you have a really low right elbow uh, and, and you, you tend to do that. Let me go to the, yeah. Like when you hit the ball, you basically bend your right elbow to hit the ball. It's almost like you're doing a bicep curl with your right elbow. And we can see you have a low elbow here and your arm is extremely bent at this point. I want you to look, and this is a bit of an exaggeration again, as I explained before. Exaggerations are something I really love to do, but I want you to notice this finish. Look how my right arm is straight, and so is my left arm. Now, the right arm being straight, again, is a bit of an exaggeration, but I want you to practice that. I want you to notice how the racket is to the left of my hands as it's coming up. My racket is what's called the left side of the letter V. You can see with your racket, like right here, this is a good view of it, your racket is the uh, right side of the letter V where my racket is staying to the left of my hands. When you hit the ball, you are very quick to bend your right elbow. What you need to do is swing from your shoulders and lift from both shoulders rather than bending your right elbow like you're doing a bicep curl. That is gonna give you a longer contact zone. It's gonna help you to be so much more accurate. You're gonna hit the ball deeper Tons of benefits come from this extension out and up without bending your elbow, but actually lifting from the shoulders. Here are two great examples of this extension out where the rack is to the left of your hand. Here we can see Taylor Fritz and look at the angle of his racket. His racket is to the left of his hands. Prior to contact, watch his racket, see what's closed. His strings are facing toward the ground slightly, not a lot, but slightly toward the ground, which is what you need in order to get your strings to face forward when you hit the ball. When you hit the ball, you want your strings to face forward. Well, they have to face down in order to make that happen. And then you just swing up and look how his racket doesn't even go over his shoulder. He stops right there. He's out in front and he's got the left side of the letter V. Strings are facing slightly open. Now, I mentioned how I want you to actually have your arms straight. He has his right elbow slightly bent. I want you to feel like both arms are straight, and I mean locked, as a mechanism of doing this. If you try to have your right elbow slightly bent, it's going to be a license for your elbow to bend way too much. So I want you to feel like it's straight the whole time. Here's Joker. You can see the racket face. Uh, well, here's the racket straight up and down. You can see he's not opening the racket at all. You can put a coin on the edge of the racket, strings are facing directly off to the side. Then he drops the racket super closed, strings are pointing down, and then look at this extension. Look at this. Racket staying to the left of his hands. He's lifting from the shoulders. He is not bending his right elbow. The angle of his right elbow is staying intact. He has an angle here between his arm, I'm sorry, his upper arm and his lower arm. That stays intact. That is the same angle, the angle there to the angle there. Then once he extends all the way out and he's got the left side of the letter V, his strings are facing slightly open and that's because his strings were closed prior to hitting. Whatever your racket is prior to hitting, you want the racket to be opposite that when you're done. So he's, his strings are facing down before contact. That gets his strings to face forward at contact, and then the natural progression is the racket's going to be slightly open after contact. Now, he's going to touch his back here, and you can see, watch his elbow, watch his elbow drop. Look at his elbow drop. The reason it drops is because it's relaxing from extending up and out toward the target. Here's a nice comparison. Look how your elbow is down, and watch your elbow rise when you go over your shoulder. See how your elbow is going up? Your elbow is making this move as you go over your shoulder. Djokovic, when he goes over the shoulder with his racket, look at his elbow drop. Now, the dropping of the elbow 
is not important. <laughs> like the fact that his elbow is dropping, it's not like, oh, I need to drop my elbow when I'm done. No, you don't have to. You can just keep your elbows up if you'd like or just extend out, which is actually what I want you to do. I want you to have this high elbow when you're done. And it's because you're not going to be bending. Your elbow is so jammed into your side right here. Your elbow is jammed into your side when you're hitting that in order to touch your back, you have to lift your elbow. Your elbow goes this way. When he touches his back, his elbow actually drops. That's how much up his arms went because he's lifting from his shoulders. His shoulders are what are lifting this racket. He's lifting up from the shoulders. You're lifting up by bending your right elbow, shortens up the contact point. You'll frame the ball more. You'll be super inconsistent and it makes you need to take a video stroke analysis lesson with me. Here's a great view of Serena. By the way, look at her racket right here. Strings are facing directly off to the side. Her racket face is not open the way yours was. And there's a slight difference. There's a slight difference between your backhand and Serena's backhand, which means over time, that difference becomes exaggerated. Over a two-hour match or pressure and there's sun and sweat in your eye and you're frustrated and all this, like any small difference, you can see her racket face closes. Any little differences between us and the pros are magnified in the heat of the moment. But look at her lift from her shoulders. She's not bending, she's not actively bending her right elbow as she hits the ball. The angle in her elbow is the same as the angle in her elbow here. Like she's just lifting up. By the way, this is the left side of the letter V from her vantage point. That's the left side of the letter V from our vantage point in the front. It looks like the right, but it's the left. And she's going up as she hits. You'll notice that she's, her strings don't point down when she's after she hits. Her racket face is slightly open after she hits the ball, just like what I demonstrated, just like Novak, just like Taylor Fritz. This is what you want to do. And remember, especially on the high ball, your racket was over here with your strings pointing down. So TJ, let's go over these ideas again. When you take the racket back, you have to keep the tip of the racket up. So when you film yourself, look to see if your racket is following that line straight back. What you do not want to do is go down to go up again for obvious, obvious reasons, as mentioned. When you take the racket back, look to see that no matter whether the contact is high or whether the contact is low, that your racket is straight up and down or one degree closed. Like you don't want to get crazy and have the racket face 45 degrees closed. That wouldn't be good. But if it's a higher ball, all right, TJ, let's go over these concepts again. The first thing is the racket tip should stay up as you take the racket back. So we do not want to follow the red line for obvious reasons. As mentioned, the tip of the racket needs to stay pointing up, which you can see. As I take my racket back, the tip of the racket is pointing at the sky. That doesn't mean that the racket is high. It just means, and you can see where my, the level of my hands are. My hands are down by my belly button. It doesn't mean your racket is high. It simply means that the tip of the racket is pointing up and that the racket is above your hands as you take the racket back. I cannot wait to see what happens to your backhand. Just keeping the tip of the racket up as you turn your body. And, you, and you'll see from the back here, look how I'm turning my body to make this happen. The next thing, when you take the racket back, you have to be able to balance a coin on the edge of the racket. You're doing beautifully when the ball is low. When the ball is coming down here to you, you have a racket that is very straight up and down, if not a few degrees closed, which is fine. Don't get crazy. You don't want your racket like this where the racket's 45 degrees closed. But you want the racket either straight up and down, like Djokovic, or it can be a few degrees closed. And that is absolutely fine. As, you know, as long as it's less than five degrees closed, you're good. That position needs to be the same whether it's a high ball or low ball. So if it's a higher ball and the ball's coming up here, you can take your racket back higher, but it still needs to be straight up and down. You don't want your racket laid open and the strings facing up. That means when the racket falls, it'll still be open. And we saw that your racket was still open and that's when you swung across and your strings face down after contact. So the racket straight up and down when you take the racket back, no matter, no matter if it's a high ball or low ball that's coming to you. The next thing, your body needs to go down and come up again. You need to go down and up, down and up. And that down and up is synchronized with your racket. 
So you go down, then you start rotating your body. Once you go down, you'll rotate your body. And you can see that the, the head goes like this as the racket goes like this, right? So the head goes down. This is what's called sit and lift. It's like you're sitting in a chair and you're coming back up. When you drop the racket from this you know, position, this on edge position where all we see is the edge of the racket, the racket needs to close. You need to tilt the strings down toward the ground, not perfectly flat, not straight to the ground where if it were a mirror, it'd be reflecting the ground that's right below it. You can see the racket is at an angle and that's what you want. Your ra you want your racket at an angle. That is what produces a racket face that is square against the back of the ball at contact. And the last thing is the extension. I want you to finish the way Taylor Fritz did. I do not want you to touch your back at the moment. And Taylor Fritz was bombing those backhands, by the way. And he was just extending out. He's one of the few pros who actually does that, who actually finishes out in front all the time on that backhand and doesn't even go over the shoulder. He just extends out. I want you to feel like you are handing your racket to your opponent. I want you to feel like your right arm is straight and your left arm, your left arm and your right arm, that if you were to drop your racket, it would fall in front of you, that that's where you're, st you're stopping. You just drop your racket and the racket falls down in front of you. You'll notice I'm looking over my left shoulder. I'm looking like, let's say my neighbor, he's got like this shrub here or whatever. I'm looking, that's his garage. I'm looking at his garage. I'm looking at my shot over my left shoulder. But my racket is to the left of my hand slightly. You were doing that on the low ball, but you really struggle with that on the high ball. And the high ball is something that I think you're very susceptible to, as most players are. And that's how Nadal would de defeat Federer early in their career. Just these hit these high balls to Federer's backhand, and he just didn't play it uh, early enough and well enough and aggressively enough. And he let the ball play him, and it really hurt him. He would destroy everyone, but then he would lose to Nadal. And it really was the spin and the leftiness that would hurt heard uh fetter so i want you to extend way out i want you when you film yourself when you're done that if you dropped your racket when you're done it would land behind you do not touch your back at the moment maybe in two months you can but you've got to do it the way um djokovic is doing and the way djokovic does it is he's extending up and you can see that he's extending up this is like i'm you know if you were to give somebody a lesson. Like as a coach, I'm looking at them from the front and I feed them a ball. That's the turn. That's the drop. Look at the extension. Here's my armpits. This is similar to what we saw with Serena. My armpits are exposed. Then you want to touch your back with your racket. Let the, let the racket go back. But you can see the way I'm doing it is I'm actually keeping my elbows up. You don't have to drop your elbows. You can keep your armpits exposed. That's why like this right here is a luxury. We don't need this. The ball's already gone. That's just to slow the racket down. What you need is to extend. Long hitting zone, swinging out towards your target. You've got the racket speed that you're going to want, and you're going to get the control that you want. So TJ, work on these ideas, and there's no doubt. You're going to gain confidence, win more matches, and play much better tennis. This is Ryan Reedy from 2MinuteTennis.net. TJ, you got this.